so white is the on and uh, blue is off? A podium laptop here. This this will work. Yeah. Okay. Very good. All yours. Yeah, all right. Oh yeah. I think I'm just going to introduce uh, David and Laura, who are, who are really going to do the introductions. But I'm really speaking on behalf of my um, friend and, and fellow conspirator, uh, Ed Schlossberg, because this is sort of, I mean, it's the beginning of an amazing research project that, that Laura and David are directing in collaboration uh, as part of a wider initiative with Thomson Reuters to really think through um, the meaning of data and the visualization of data. And we hesitate even to, to separate the word data and visualization because even the word data, surely an image came into your mind when I said it. So you've already begun. And so data is, is always, always a question of visualization. And of course, being in an architecture school, we, we are very used to the, the thought that um, the way you visualize something is the way you think about it. So if visualizing data is already to think it through, so it's already to interpret it. So when people act as if there would be such a thing called data that could then be visualized or could then be interpreted or then be used, this project is, of course, uh, resisting that. But we still hold on to the expression data visualization as if that's a useful place to start. But we just really are interested to zoom in on what people believe is the moment where data starts and stops and demonstrate that that's actually an extraordinarily creative moment and generally when you encounter what you think of as data you're encountering uh, an extreme form of creativity that has been devoted uh, to that point a form of creativity that's generally not acknowledged and it's likely to be what it is that you're experiencing so in the context of a university it means that when we exchange thoughts with each other we are to some extent uh, that's a kind of simplification. We are to some extent exchanging different ways of visualizing or different ways of considering what would a thought be. And, and Ed and I have been obsessing about the fact that, that a great research university, therefore, would only be great to the extent that it rethinks that seemingly very simple gesture of visualizing data. Uh, I should say you can run the argument in reverse and say, um, perhaps, that there's no visualization without data. So also when people tell you that they're about to make an image of something or to visualize something or, or, or they want you to relax and say, I'm, I just give you an image or something like that, be warned because in that moment, uh, whatever data is, it's doing its work. So we're very interested in playing both sides of the argument. We've suggested to Columbia University that the architecture school um, can act as a host for this very wide ranging uh, analysis. So really in many ways this evening is, the big, is a sort of soft launch of a very major research project that we're enormously proud to do with Thomson Reuters. No one worries more about what this word data might mean than one of the great data keepers uh, and transmitters and, uh, of the universe. And, and we think together somehow this is also marks a, a kind of a different kind of collaboration between a research university and, and industry. And I feel very strongly that whatever it is, the, the city of the future that we will occupy in 2050 or so, that is to say the city of our children or grandchildren, whatever that city is, it simply will not have any interest in the distinction between a research university and industry. And I don't think one would able, be able to be successful in the industrial world without all of the capacity we currently associate with the research university on the one side, and you won't be a decent university on the other hand if you're not um, uh, thinking in the way that industry thinks. So we also feel like this is another kind of partnership, not just on the borderline between data and visualization, a borderline which we refuse, um, hopefully with elegance, um, but also we, we are on the borderline of industry and university, and we also refuse a simplistic distinction there. And I think I couldn't imagine two better people than to direct this project than, than Laura and, and, and David, who really are 
uh, much more interesting than we are. So I'll stop talking and ha hand over to them and they will introduce their guests. But for those of you in the room, just to understand, this is, is a kind of public soft launch of a project that actually has been underway for about two years in faculty seminars and research and, and so on and is really going to accelerate and become pretty obnoxious by the spring um, and fully fledged and fully uh, grown. So you're um, witnessing the birth of a monster um, and the two Frankenstein producers are here. Um, thanks, Mark, <laughs> and thanks, Ed. Ed should probably be up here. Maybe you can ask a question also later on. Um, so here we are. It's the beginning of the um, Advanced Data Visualization Project. And aside from what Mark um, has, a, has already said, what we're trying to do um, is to establish collaborations with various fields across the, across the university. So by the end of the year, we'll have six projects. Um, one will be collaborating with the journalism school, with the um, what, bio biology, biology, I don't wanna say biology school, computational biology, um, with the Lamont labs up in the northern New Jersey um, Palisades, um, and also with the library, where, we're, where the library is sort of the meta project um, thinking about how the university is changing completely because of the, the, the way that we use data. So we have here today, we don't have any architects. Um, we have three um, disciplines which will introduce hopefully the way that they use data and think about the way their fields have changed because of the way that they use data. And that's part of what we're um, trying to ask is whether any professional um, using data nowadays and has to visualize it can do that by themselves, or whether that requires a team of people like architects, like graphic designers, like computational um, scientists who, think, who, who might think more visually um, than the ways that data really trains us, trains us to do. And so the big question of our project is how um, all this data turns into knowledge that we can think with and use in more, in more, precise, in more precise ways. So I'm going to introduce the first speaker, who's Matthew Jockers. Um, and uh, he is an assistant professor of English and faculty in the Center for Digital Research in the Humanities at the University of Nebraska. Um, prior to that, he was a lecturer and, academ and academic technology specialist in the Department of English at Stanford, where he co-founded and directed with Franco Moretti um, the Stanford Literary Lab. Jocker's research involves computational approaches to the study of large collections of literature, what he calls macro-analysis. His approach has much in common with the corpus linguistics and borrows from text mining, informational retrieval, and natural language processing. His research focus, however, is on strictly literary questions. I might challenge you on that at the end. <laughs> um, especially questions related to literary history and the nature of the literary, literary change over time. Jocker's published work includes essays on computational approaches to authorship attribu attribution, as well as papers on Irish American English literature. His book, Macro Analysis, Digital Methods and Literary History, will be published by the University of Illinois Press in 2013. His work has been profiled many places, and I really encourage you to look at his blog, um, and mainstream press, including Nature, Wired, New Scientist, Smithsonian, and NBC. He holds the distinction, and this is the best part of his bio, of being the first English professor to assign 1,200 novels in one class. So I hope he's going to show some of that today. <laughs> OK, so and then David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a privilege to be part of a monster, uh, an obnoxious monster, I think. Uh, so thank you. Um, let me cut to the chase then and get to literature where I'm more comfortable. In, uh, in literary studies, we have no shortage of anecdotal wisdom regarding the role that influence plays in literary production and creativity. Consider just a few of the most <clears throat> prominent voices. 
talents imitate, geniuses steal, Oscar Wilde famously quipped. All ideas are secondhand, consciously and unconsciously drawn from a million outside sources, Mark Twain tells us in 03. The historical sense compels a man to write, not merely with his own generation in his bones, but with the feeling that the whole of literature has a simultaneous existence. And then the formalist, Osip Brick, the elements of which the artwork are created are external to the author and independent of him. And then most recently, uh, the literary critic, Harold Bloom, who's written now two books on influence. Well, whether consciously influenced by predecessors or not, I think it might be argued that every book is in some sense a necessary descendant of or necessarily connected to those that come before it. Influence may be a conscious borrowing or it may happen as an unconscious assimilation of what is present in a larger literary ecosystem. These thinkers noted here offer us anecdotal evidence. My interest is in whether or not we can track influence in objective ways. Well, the answer to that is probably not. Measuring or tracking actual influence, true influence, conscious or unconscious, is probably impossible or at least indeterminate. We could speculate, but never really know. But I think it is, however, possible to measure similarity. And we can calculate the similarity of one book to another by measuring the presence or absence of certain types of linguistic material. And this proxy, similarity instead of influence, is, I think, a legitimate one. After all, when we speak of literary influence, we almost always mean similarity in terms of style or theme, sometimes also in terms of plot or form, but generally style or theme. In a recent talk I gave, which is available as a screencast on my website, matthewjockers.net, I went into some great detail about much of this business of influence. So if there are any literary scholars here who want to uh, follow that uh, thread, uh, please go there for the details. Tonight I want to skip through some of that detail and focus more specifically upon the visual aspects of my work. In point of fact, in my research, I, I deal with 3,500 19th century novels, and thus a picture is literally worth about a half a billion words. <clears throat> so. My corpus consists of approximately 3,500. I think there's really uh, 3,346 19th century books. These cover a span of, uh, sorry, that should be 140 years, uh, but really the main concentration of them is in the, the century between 1800 and 1900. Uh, they are composed primarily of British and Irish, including Welsh and Scottish uh, texts, as well as American texts almost uh, even in terms of uh, a gender, especially if we consider that many of the anonymous authors are likely to be females. From each one of these 3,500 books, I extract and quantify both stylistic and thematic information. The stylistic information is extracted using word tokenization, chunking of the chopping up of the text by words. Uh, and techniques that we uh, typically employ in authorship attribution and what's called stylometry. Basically, I calculate the relative frequencies of every single word in every single text. I also do the same for uh, other features, punctuation and so on. And then in this stylistic analysis, we attempt to uh, exclude context sensitive words and focus in on those high, uh, high frequency words that are the sort of stylistic ticks of authors. And here again, I could go into much greater detail in a question if, if you want a question about the, the efficacy of this kind of work. But for now, let me skip ahead to say that I selected the 92 most highly, highly frequent words in this corpus, uh, sorry, uh, words and marks of punctuation to use as a generator of a stylistic signal. To extract the thematic data, I employ latent Dirichlet allocation or what is more formally known, or more uh, familiarly known as topic modeling. Topic models provide an, uh, an algorithmic way of detecting and measuring the themes or topics that occur in a collection of texts. I'm definitely not gonna detail how this process works. It's very complicated, and I also provide a, a description of this in the video and, and in a blog entry on my website. But instead, so I'll ask you instead to indulge me uh, and let me show you a couple of examples of results from what this model returns as evidence for the efficacy of the model. 
here are two, uh, I don't usually like to use word, uh, word clouds, um, especially as a piece of, of, of something to analyze, but here I'm not using them for analysis, but rather to show these are words that the model found to be um, cohabitating together in many places in the corpus. And it extracts these in an unsupervised way. In other words, I don't tell it in advance that these are words uh, related to American slavery. The model simply goes in and identifies these. Um, and then this one uh, having to do with uh, Irish tenants and landlords. <clears throat> All of this stylistic information from the high frequency words and information about the saturation of these themes in every single text are then uh, munged together into a long row of data where each row in a spreadsheet, you can imagine each row represents a single text and the columns represent all of these features that I've measured. Uh, 100 uh, high frequency word features, 500 thematic uh, measurements. To generate an aggregate measure of a book's similarity across these 600 variables to another book, I employ the Euclidean metric, which I won't spend time on here either, but it's a fairly simple calculation. It results in a distance matrix, which a piece of which looks like this, where the, the resulting matrix is 3,400 and uh, 3,346 by 3,346 and each row is a book and each column is a book and the number in the cell is the measured distance between them. You can think of these distances like uh, feet or miles if you like. So the distance between Carlton's first novel in my collection and itself is exactly zero. And the distance between Carlton's second, uh, first novel and his 10th novel is 1.67 and so on. <clears throat> For visualizing all of this data that's in this matrix, network uh, visualization software provides a very excellent tool. But before I can do that, I have to convert this matrix into something that the network software understands. So I create a long form table in which I have many, many more uh, rows and three columns. The first column is a source book. The second book is the, is the book that it's being measured next to. And the third column is that distance. So here in my dummied example, book one is zero distance from book one and 1 1.3 for whatever from, uh, from book two and so on. Now because this ends up being many, many millions of rows, I can then uh, reduce the data even further. The first thing I do is I remove all the cases where the target book is published in a year, in the same year as the source book or in a year prior because the influence I'm interested in tracking only works in one direction, right? Moby Dick can't have a influenced uh, sense and sensibility. It doesn't work that way. Uh, and then I also reduce the data further for computational convenience by subselecting only those books that are, that are kind of very close in terms of similarity to the source book. So in the way that that big distance matrix works, remember that every single book is, is measured against every other single book. And in this case, the distances ran from less than one to over 100. So in cases where there was a very, very far distance, I excluded some of those with the understanding that I really am interested in the ones that are, that are very similar. So networks or graphs as they are called, um, uh, in some of the literature are constructed out of two primary elements, nodes and edges. And for our purposes here, nodes are the individual books and the edges are the measured distances between them. Nodes with a smaller uh, distance between them are pulled together by the software, uh, like gravity, and nodes with a uh, greater distance between them tend to be pushed apart. This figure offers a very simplified example Books three and books two are closer than books one and book two. Well, there's a number of different layout options uh, that are available for analyzing this kind of network data. And I'm using an open source program called Gephi, which uh, is very handy for this sort of thing. This figure shows the entire book network, my corpus of 19th century novels laid out using an, an algorithm called Force Atlas II, which does what I just described. It attempts to push the the nodes apart while pulling them together if the distances are closer. <clears throat> um, Gephi also provides an option that allows for coloring of the nodes based on the metadata that I have about those individual books. 
And with the addition of uh, coloring, or in this case, grayscaling, uh, several of the large macro structures of the corpus are made visible. In this image, the nodes and the edges have been colored according to the publication years of the source books. The lighter gray nodes and edges indicate works from earlier in the century, over here in the west, and the darker nodes are from later in the century. So the further back we go, the lighter the nodes become. Well, this shading reveals a clear style, a clear um, chronological time signature to the stylistic thematic data. What's important to bear in mind, however, is that there is nothing in this data that told the algorithm, told the program what years these works were published in. It was only after turning on this coloring that I saw this stylistic shift taking place. The works have been clustered together based on their stylistic and thematic affinity, not upon their dates of publication. Here's the same network, but this time I've recolored the nodes according to the gender of the authors. And here the darker black nodes are the female authored text, and the lighter nodes at the top are the male authored text. So here again, the software and the uh, algorithms knew nothing about the genders of the author. It was only after turning on the, the, uh, the coloring that this structure was made apparent. What this is telling us, in essence, is that at least in the 19th century, there are certain habits of style and theme, thematic choices associated with the genders of authors. A few macro structures, other sort of uh, smaller macro structures are also visible in this big blob. Uh, here circled happens to be a cluster of works that are all by uh, Margaret Oliphant. This second cluster, uh, which there it is appearing, uh, contains a great many works by Scottish authors. Uh, six novels by Sir Walter Scott are included in there, along with Robert Louis Stevenson, Henrietta Ketty, and, Ketty and some others. And then there's this one, which I can't make any sense out of. Uh, there, I take some stabs at it in some other work, but I'm not going to get into the details there because I want to. I want to move on. So here is a slide showing the entire network, and now I've recolored the um, the nodes in more stereotypical uh, colors for the male and females, um, and I've drawn. Uh, the works by Herman Melville in slightly larger nodes so that we can see this cluster. So first thing to notice that's important is of course that they all are clustering in the male uh, dominated section of the graph which we would expect. And the other thing to notice is that they appear exactly where we would expect them to appear in terms of chronology. This is the uh, part of the graph that is the sort of 1850s uh, period. And we also notice the one exception, and that's this node that's way up here in the, in the highland cluster, as it were. This, uh, this one node at first didn't make any sense to me until I uh, went back to Melville and started studying and realized that this novel is Israel Potter, which was, even among Melville's books, an oddball book. Melville wrote it very quickly. It was based on an autobiography. He wrote it quickly because Pierre had just failed miserably and he, was, and he was in need of some cash. It's also a shorter novel and it's considered by many to be Melville's easiest book to read. Um, those of us who have read Moby Dick know that that's not necessarily the easiest read. So it makes sense that this shows up as an outlier. This image shows works by Sir Walter Scott up there in the Highland Cluster. Um, as a rule, Scott's novels cluster in a vertical band, if we were to draw it down again, that's dominated by works published in the 1840s. Well, Scott, of course, is writing more in the teens, um, so he's ahead of his time by about 20 or 30 years. Or seen another way, we might imagine that Scott's influence in the late teens and 20s comes to dominate the work of writers in this period of the 1840s. <clears throat> And so in terms of the way that the network algorithm works, Scott's works are pulled into this section of the graph instead of to the left where they actually belong chronologically because their signal is more like the signal that is found in that portion of the graph. This image shows works of Jane Austen. Unlike the male author Scott and Melville that we just looked at, most of Austen's works cluster in the lower female portion of the graph. Austin's works also tend to be clustered in the appropriate place in terms of time. This is about where, where her novels should be. Except, of course, for the two outliers, Persuasion and Lady Susan. Now, at this stage, in case there are literary colleagues in the audience, 
I need to acknowledge that I'm neither an expert in the 19th century novel nor in Jane Austen more specifically. But nevertheless, it's occurred to me that these two novels, one written very early in life and one at, a very, at the very end of her life, do share some interesting qualities. Lady Susan is thematically similar to much of Austen's other writings. In other words, it deals with marriage and courtship themes and so on. But this book is unique in presenting a heroine who is altogether different from Austen's typical heroine. Lady Susan is older, colder, nastier, and more manipulative. That different tone and sentiment, if you will, may account for this work's placement away from the main cluster. Persuasion, it seems to me, shares something of this tone in all, uh, as well, in, uh, being Austin's strongest social commentary, but it also shares in its presentation of a heroine who is somewhat past her prime, as someone who is only, uh, <clears throat> sorry, and as someone who is only a casual and admittedly not very excited reader of Austin, I'll leave further speculation to others who are more qualified to explain my results. Now this slide plots the works of George Eliot. It's the one that was on the poster. And I show it here only because I found it so interesting that Eliot's works all plot in the male-dominated half of the network. Of course, George Eliot was the pseudonym of the female author Mary Ann Evans. I don't have anything more to say about this graph other than it was interesting enough to pique the curiosity of an Eliot expert who I'm now collaborating with on a study of Eliot's prose style and use of theme. So now very quickly, the last couple of slides I just show, they all deal with Lawrence Stern's somewhat remarkable novel, Tristram Shandy. Tristram Shandy was published in 1759. It's the earliest work I have in my corpus and it should appear right over here where the question mark is and yet it appears here in a period that is dominated by the 1820s. And uh, did this, there it goes. In this slide, what I've done is to remove all of the stylistic uh, data from the calculation. So this is just thematic space, and what's happened here is that Shandy has now shifted from the 1820s to the 1840s. Now the whole graph has changed a little bit because now we're just plotting the thematics. But it's interesting to see that the themes that dominate Tristram Shandy are most realized in the 1840s, not in 1759 when it was published. And then when I remove all of the thematic stuff and plot just the stylistic information, Tristram Shandy moves to this point. Why don't I have a vertical bar with the dates here? Well, because when we shift it to stylistic data, we lose some of that chronological signal. And so to really see what's happening with style, I have to zoom in on that node and look at the dates of the other texts that were published around it. So there it is in 1759, surrounded by 1870, 1881, 1851, 1853, and so on. In fact, uh, the mean date of publication for works that are most similar to Tristram Shandy in terms of its stylistic signal is 1853 almost a full century, 93 years after the publication of the first volume of Stern's book. Well, what this all tells us about Tristram Shandy's importance and its lasting influence is the topic of another paper that I've now just begun. That much in Tristram Shandy anticipates the modernist novel of Joyce and of Wolfe is something that I'm especially drawn to, and it's a matter of personal satisfaction to me to find this kinship between Stern's novel and the more experimental works of Joyce and Wolfe, and that this was a point that was first noticed by the formalist critics, who I very much admire. Though I call my methodology macroanalysis, the kind of criticism that I'm engaged in here may be best called quantitative formalism. Thank you. So uh, we're going to do questions and a little bit of uh, discussion at the end. Um, uh, but at this point, I want to introduce our second speaker, um, Ali Brinvalu. Uh, Ali is a professor at Rockefeller University, a developmental biologist, and a leader in the international effort to understand the inter intricacies of human stem cells and to harness their therapeutic potential. Uh, recently. Brinvalu and colleagues discovered a compound that prevents cultured embryonic stem cells from differentiating, 
thereby maintaining their readiness to develop into any cell type. This breakthrough is a first step uh, towards safely cultivating stem cells for medical use, um, and it also provides insight into the mechanisms responsible for stem cell self-renewal. Brinvalu has played a key role in setting scientific standards for embryonic stem cell research and in defining which embryonic cells are true stem cells. Uh, he's a recognized international leader in this field. His many honors include a Klingenstein Fellowship and a Presidential Early Career Award, the U.S. government's highest recognition for young scientists. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome uh, Ali Brinvalu here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, very kind introduction. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a great honor to be part of this forum. I'm a developmental biologist, as you heard. Actually, a simpler way to define what I do is an embryologist. I'm interested in how to generate forms dynamically in different animals. And uh, I've spent most of my career in trying to figure out how you make a tadpole this is a frog tadpole. It's made about 40 million cells. And it's an amazingly complicated structure. It is completely independent. It can swim in pond water, evade predators. It can feed. It can follow a group and have a clear agenda about what kind of directionality she wants to take in life. But things start in a very simple way before you generate these kind of organic forms. And these kind of forms, evolving in time is not something that is anything new in embryology. If you followed the news today, you probably heard that Sir John Gordon got the Nobel Prize for experiments that he had done in the late 60s, uh, cloning the first animal. And the first animal that was cloned is not Dolly the sheep, unlike what is perceived by uh, the news media, but it was actually a frog. So the, the understanding of how you generate a form that is a duplicate of its original started with the amphibian system, and the amphibian embryos have been traditionally the platform where embryologists have explored change of forms dynamically. And there are many reasons for that. If one looks at the beginning, uh, this tadpole starts with really one or two cells. You can see these two hemispheres. That's something very magical happens very quickly. Uh, the diameter, by the way, here is about one millimeter, so each cell is about half a millimeter. And these one, two cells are going to become the 40 million cells that I showed you on the first slide within about 24 hours. And it goes something a little bit like this. There is a very fast multiplication of a sphere. There is movements within the sphere. Five of them are lined up here, five are at the bottom. Very quickly, you see that there is movement and transformation. You start discovering the formation of the head and the tail. And then the tadpole frees itself from the membrane, commingles, cocktail parties discussions, interruptions, <laughs> some uh, unusual type of behavior, and then the tadpole moves on to the pond. How does this magic happen? How is it that you actually move from one or two cells to generate such a complex form in a very dynamic fashion? And of course, I don't need to tell you that later on this tadpole would go to another major change with metamorphosis to become a fully grown up frog that doesn't share anything anatomically or physiologically the same as this tadpole. So it's, a, it's truly a, an evolution, a very dynamic evolution of uh, organic and biological form that I'm interested in following and trying to figure out what are the coordinates that establish these changes at the cellular level and at the molecular level. All right, so when you talk about uh, shapes and forms in developmental biology and embryology, you really talk about a series of hierarchical decisions that cells have to make. This is a ball of cells for that tadpole. It's about 128 cells in this sphere. And uh, at a given point, each one of these cells within that sphere has to make a decision as to what they're going to be. Are they going to be heart cells or, or brain cells or, or blood? So what is it that defines the identity of a cell and that ultimately generates the change in form? Obviously, if you're going to be the muscle cell, you will have a different shape than if you're going to be a nerve cell, and et cetera. And there was really two schools of thought originally. Embryology is a very old branch of biology, as for as long as people could crack an egg and draw what they saw inside or go to the pond and figure out how 
tadpoles become frogs, a lot of descriptive work was done. And there was really two major schools of ideas. The first one was called the British School of Fate Determination that suggested that a cell within this ball, a group of cells know who she is based on the lineage she comes from. So, you know, this is very British. If your uh, daddy and mommy are aristocrats, then you're going to be uh, following that fate. And if they are not as lucky, you're going to become something maybe less important, like, I don't know, liver or guts or something like that. Uh, the second school of thought, and this is 19th century, at the turn of 20th century, there was a challenge by ambiologists in the US, actually, led by, by Hamilton. And um, the suggestion was that no, it's not really lineage that defines fate, it is actually the neighborhood that tells a cell what kind of identity she should have. And to make a very long story short, this is a short talk, uh, uh, I can just tell you that the American school won, and it was correct. Uh, so, and the way this is demonstrated is that if you label this one cell and you follow it, you can tell with very good accuracy based on Cartesian coordinates as to what part of that sphere would give rise to what kind of organ. Yet if I remove this one cell from this position and transplant it to a different position, she will adopt the fate of the new neighborhood rather than following the one that she originally came from. And that was really the strongest evidence to suggest that things are very plastic in terms of fate determination and is really dictated by the neighborhood that you're finding yourself. So what does it mean uh, that your identity is defined by your environments and by your neighborhood? It really means very simply that if you're gonna make a decision as to what type of cell you're gonna become, and that's gonna change the form of that sphere and, and your own form, you will have to communicate continuously with your neighbors. I represent this communication with these arrows. So very, very quickly, there is information that's exchanged between the neighbors and back from the cell to the neighbors. I'm not gonna go to the molecular biology of what these signals are and the piece of DNA that are involved in interpreting the signals and changing extrinsic information to an intrinsic uh, output. But uh, suffice it to say that cracking the code of this kind of communication has been really uh, keeping my lab and other labs interested in this kind of uh, phenomena extremely busy for the past 10, 20 years. And, and to a large extent now with the, with the genome in our back pocket and all the information at the molecular level, we have a very good understanding as to what kind of a signal does a cell have to receive from its neighbor to realize what kind of fate to contribute to. Now this is, uh, I'm not gonna go to more details about this, I'll be happy to answer questions if, if you want, but I'm just gonna tell you one thing that I was personally interested when I started my lab, uh, actually quite some time ago on the east side, was okay, so if, if this is really, uh, if fate is really determined by what kind of neighborhood you have or you, you belong to, then what kind of fate will you adapt in the absence of any neighbor? And I thought that was a fair question because it would define what the default would be. Um, if I don't get any information or if I'm completely deaf to the information that I receive from my surrounding, what kind of fate will I adapt? And again, to make about 15 years of work uh, in one or two sentences, I can tell you that the fate that you will adapt, and this is not only true for the frog, but also for humans that we'll show you later on, is to become a brain cell. So that was a bit counterintuitive because we always think of the brain and the central nervous system as one of the most complex organs and therefore the suggestions that cracking the code that actually tells a cell how to become a heart cell would be easy, but figuring out how a cell decides to become a brain cell is gonna be very difficult and it turns out for reasons that are actually evolutionarily uh, uh, interesting to, to debate that uh, the simplest way fate to generate in the absence of any signaling is to become a brain cell and a neuron that becomes the brain. So for the rest of the talk, rather than going to technicalities and jargon about uh, what the nature of the signaling is, what does it mean not to be able to respond, I thought I would just show you a little potpourri, a little collection of the kind of uh, visualization we do as we're trying to decipher communication between cells and follow their fates, and give you an impression about the way we look at uh, this visual uh, data in order to draw the conclusions that we draw in trying to understand change of form and shape dynamically in, in organic systems. So uh, I have uh, an example of cell communication here. And again, I'm not gonna go through any technical details. Uh, I'll be happy to ad address them if you have questions. But here I have two images. Uh, this is the nucleus of the cell and this is the membrane. So you can extrapolate from this. And the same is true here. I'm uh, portraying two types of communication. On the first one here, 
cells are continuously talking and the nuclei are always on. When the nuclei is on, that means that the cell has, is responding to a signal. It just received a signal and is responding to it. So that's one type of communication. It's just like um, a, a, a white noise background that is necessary to know that you even have neighbors, never mind to be able to answer to what they're saying. But superimposed to this kind of continuous white noise information that, that is happening extremely fast. Remember that the embryo goes from one cell to 40 million cells in, in about 24 hours. So every 15 minutes, the cell divides and it becomes two, four, eight, 16, et cetera. So this communication happens continuously. On top of that, there is what happens on the other panel, where you can see much more a starry way of communicating. So not all the cells have the nucleus on, so that means that not all of them are receiving a signal, but a very small group of them are able at any given time to receive something and respond to it. Uh, understanding the pattern that governs that kind of co-firing or independent firing in response to signal is still one of the ongoing efforts in the lab. And, uh, and just to give you an impression that we're not talking about a very coherent form of communication or language, we're talking about several levels of communications that are superimposed on top of one another, and I'm showing you uh, two of them. There's probably more than hundreds of them superimposed in very, very fast rate. So the outcome of all this integration of signals give rise to the independent phase, which then change the form gradually and make that sphere become a bilaterally symmetrical organism that we recognize as the tadpole. Now we can do this in a, in a fraction of the embryo, but we can also do this other approach called lineage tracing. So we can follow, we can take a live embryo, like in this case, and each one of these is one cell. And by using quantum dot technology, uh, this is again nanoparticles I will be happy to address in, in the quantum level and physics level and the equations, but, but just for you to have an impression about the possibility of using this imaging technique to follow up cells for a very, very long period of time. You're looking on the top of that sphere, and that gives you an impression about what things are. So at the beginning, things are very coherent and very much together. You can zoom into that, and now you can see more interesting communication. So within itself, the nucleus itself is moving back and forth. It's not a static way. It's as if the nucleus is going toward where the information is physically, in addition to responding to it. It allows us to have, uh, for the first time, uh, the understanding in static images you will never be able to detect that kind of intracellular motions in response to signals. We can also push it farther in detection of the formation of organs. This is the beginning of the formation of the pancreas in a tadpole. And so we can follow individual cells, the relationship with one another, and, and actually who is receiving the signal at what time and what kind of frequency, and then regenerate those signals to reintroduce that fate to other cells. So quantum dot imaging is one of the more modern way to do lineage tracing and to follow the fate of cells directly in vivo. Uh, another way to do this is what is called four-dimensional imaging. And, and uh, this is a transgenic tadpole. Uh, what you're looking at, this tadpole is a little bit older than the one that I showed you. It's about two days old. So it has 120 million cells or so. And what you're looking at is 30 microscopes firing at the same time. There are three on this axis and there are 10 on this axis. And, and the way we, we get this going is we have computers that coordinate the imaging uh, four dimensionally of a tadpole among 30 independent microscopes. They integrate that as a tile and they run it synchronously so that you can see the image that you have here. What you're seeing in the green signal is the nervous system and uh, you're looking at this in the Z plan. So the camera is going in and out of this three dimensional structure. Obviously a tadpole is three dimensional uh, and so you're looking at the signal going from top to bottom and then back again. So that provides the three dimension of the imaging. The fourth dimension is time, and this is highlighted by the heart beating here. So this tadpole is alive. As you're taking this image, uh, it's not a dead or a fixed sample. It's something that is actually going to the development itself as you're imaging it. So that provides a platform to look at the architecture of the nervous system at the time of its formation dynamically, but also to evaluate the influence of insults or attractants to the change of shape that this architecture takes. You can also take individual panels, like in this case, the junction between the brain and the spinal cord, and allow this Z-stack to go in with tremendous resolution, so you can see cell bodies, you can see all the wiring, and again, back in and out of the image from that one square, you can reconstitute uh, four-dimensionally all the connections. So if this was 
uh, analogy for the city is, is as if you're following uh, the telephone company is making the, the wires as they happen and you follow them in time and you, you can understand the logic behind why the wiring is done in a given way rather than in a different way. You can also take another section and, and play with this same information in a different manner. And we're we're going to go to the anterior part of a tadpole in the brain. And now what I'm going to do is to reconsider this three-dimensionally and rotate. That what this allows us to do is if one train hides the other and you're taking a picture on the side, you would not see the second one. This kind of two-dimensional rotation allows you to look at the structure, the brain in this case, of the tadpole uh, within, the, within the, the, the four dimensions that I described. This is the anterior part, these projections of the olfactory, this is the nose, and so everything is already wired up and ready to go. And of course, as I mentioned to you, this type is completely free and independent in swimming in, in pond water. Okay, so um, a big chunk of my work was dedicated to understand and crack the code on the establishment of fate in a very simple amphibian system. The next immediate question is how much of this information is evolutionary conserved and, and relevant to our own development? And um, uh, there are a couple of slides and, and movies I'm going to show you here that have been unpublished, and some of them cannot be filmed. This is actually one of them. And again, there are reasons why this is the case, and I will be happy to address them during the discussion. But the purpose of putting this up is that in the case of humans, in, our, in the case of our own development, we obviously will not have access to the kind of embryos and technologies that we have in the amphibian system, so we have to visualize the data and our interpretation of it in a way that is extremely selective and based on priorities. As you can imagine, the source of biological material is, is very limited, and so once you have a human embryo, the kind of imaging that you can do from it uh, becomes extremely nerve-wracking because you don't want to mess up that one experiment. It's very difficult to get uh, another one to, to go. So one way of doing this is this time around, instead of doing four dimension, we, do, we start slowly in three-dimensional imaging with fixed samples. So what you're going to see here is, is the same human embryo here with phase contrast. Again, we're going to go in and out in the Z-plane. And here I'm going to use virtual reality to actually walk you inside of the embryo so that you can see and rotate. Uh, about where things come from. And I've color-coded three different cell types, the red, green, and blue, that are the landmarks of the human embryo. This is five days old, five days after fertilization. And so the data is uh, a little bit heavy, but it's loading well now. So I'm rotating the human embryo. You're going inside of it. This is the basis of it. You can see that the blue cells are surrounded with the red and green ones. I'm not going to go to any technique about what this really implies, but it tells you that there are very clear geometry and delineation of independent structures within that sphere, very much like the frog, but in slightly bit different coordinate, that cells know their identity within different territories, and that, that identity changes and uh, very fast evolves to, toward generation of forms. And of course, generation of forms in human has a lot of similarity with the ones that amphibian use, but also some very unique trait. So one other way to study human embryos in the absence of biological material and that makes it very precious and difficult to obtain is to use human embryonic stem cells. And in, in the introduction, uh, you heard that my lab has been pioneering techniques in, in deriving cells from human embryos. So we have an unlimited source of studying early human development without having to go directly to embryos per se. And uh, you can isolate them, the, the, the blue cells that I showed you from uh, the previous picture, and this is what they look like dynamically. The nucleus is in green, and the subset of the cytoplasm is in red. These cells are magical, uh, and uh, they have a counterpart in all other systems, in fish and amphibians and others. They're magical in the sense that they're called pluripotent. They can give rise to every single cell type of the body. So they can really go ahead and generate muscle, blood, bone, brain. So this is one platform where you can say, is the language that's being used between these cells to communicate fate the same as in the frog, or are there differences? And I can, again, shorten many years of work by telling you that it's actually exactly the same. For example, the formation of the human brain follows the exact same principle as the formation of the brain of a tadpole. Elimination of contact and communication between the cells is sufficient to elicit the most anterior part of the brain. And, uh, and of course, the human brain is different, not only this, this is brain, human brain structures derived from stem cells, is different not only from the tadpole in its anatomy, but of course in its wiring and its shape. So 
the neocortex, the most anterior part of our brain, is the site of cognition, is what allows us to be human, is where language comes from, and it's uh, obviously what makes us different than, than, than other animals. Yet, the way you get there, the way you establish that initial fate, this telencephalic fate, the fate of a brain, is evolutionary conserved over millions of years. In fact, recent discoveries by other labs shows that the same uh, is applicable to the fruit fly and arthropods. So even though the insect has the nervous system in the ventral side and not in the dorsal side like we do, and even though the brain of an insect is quite different than the brain of a vertebrate, um, the, principle, the embryonic principle behind that fate determination is evolutionary conserved. That is, when nature discovers one way to establish fate that is successful, it keeps on using it and, uh, and then changes the shape and the form downstream of the original design of it. Uh, these are uh, uh, um, two slides I'm going to show you about the fact that the human brain in, uh, in culture from embryonic stem cells, the, the nucleus is in blue, you can see that the wiring is actually also very similar. This picture doesn't give it justice. I cannot do it in 20 minutes, but take my word for it that the, the way the architecture of wiring is done is also exactly the same as in the tadpole. So there is a given order and sequence of wiring. If this was a telephone company that you didn't know, you would say, aha, uh -huh, this is the one that I saw before, and I can predict where they're going to go next. And so in that sense, it generates a paradigm where you can, for the first time, I think, uh, address the role of the molecular basis of conscientiousness. Uh, this is beyond self fate determination because the nervous system obviously uh, has other functions and I'm sure that the tadpole has its own complexity, but never in, in, in our own case has it been a ability to look at the beginning of the formation of the connection, the processing. So you, you see in a Petri dish this kind of uh, group of cells together the red nuclei, and then a tremendous wiring and communication between them. Clearly, they're talking to one another. It's not very clear at this point. I don't understand what they're saying, but they're certainly talking and communicating. All right, so I'm going to finish with three slides here. And uh, everything that I showed you about the human side, unlike the frog, is done in the Petri dish. It's in a plastic dish, and one can always argue, and biologists are very picky about that, that this does not reflect necessarily what happens in vivo, in the context of a whole embryo. This is particularly important because I and others have insisted that embryonic stem cells are defined functionally by their ability to contribute to all cell type, not in a petri dish, but in an embryo. So how are we going to do this with, with human cells? Uh, the idea of taking a human, cell, uh, human embryonic stem cells and putting it back in the human embryo to ask if it does the same thing in vivo is obviously out of the question. So one of the, one of the ways that we and others have overcome this, originally based on the work done at the Rockefeller in Mala, was to substitute that with a model embryo. So what we use is a mouse embryo, a 16 cell stage mouse embryo, and we present the human cells, human embryonic stem cells, to the mouse embryo. And we color code the cells, that way we can follow them in the context of development during mouse embryogenesis. Human cells are in green. The other two colors are mouse cells. So one thing that you see quite amazingly when you look at this, and again, is this stack going in and out, is that the human cells actually contribute to the mouse embryo very early, not only do they go in, but they home to exactly where they come from. This green structure here is the origin of the cells from the human embryo. So when we take the cells out from a five-day-old human and we present them as sample presentations in the mouse, they actually get in and they home to exactly their origin. There's about 500 million years of difference, uh, separation between mouse and human, and I can guarantee you that under no circumstance I can imagine, I would say even in New York City, that these two cell types would be juxtaposed to one another. <laughs> that, so that tells you about the power of evolutionary conservation, that, that this is really hardwired within the cells. They know the Cartesian coordinate despite these very long evolutionary distances. Um, this is another one where, where the human cells are going to be in green. I'm gonna, not going to talk about this technicality here. Do not worry about it. Just to say that we recognize different parts accurately in the mouse embryos. And then what I'm going to do is to take you inside this embryo again by virtual reality. The mouse cells are red, the human cells are green. This is just to make the point that the human cells actually do contribute to mouse embryos. So the later stage of development, 12, uh, E12, mouse gestation is 21 days. Uh, human obviously is nine months. So uh, the amazing thing about this is that the human cells are actually following the rhythm of the mouse and not the original rhythm. And this is very similar to the argument about neighborhood where the environment actually dictates not only fate, but the speed of accomplishing a given uh, endpoint in fate.
Okay, and then my last slide, and this is also one of the slides that hasn't been published and cannot be filmed uh, for reasons that I think might be obvious later on or else I'll be happy to address it. This is the latest uh, stage of chimerism, a formation of chimera between human and mouse. The human cells are in red and the subset of the mouse cells are in green. And what you see here again is an amazing uh, uh, acceptance of the fact that um, forms that do not exist in the natural world can be generated by very simple recreation of environments when you mix cells of two different species. And the contribution of the cells in human here ranges from the cells of the retina of the eye, the sensory organs, whiskers, that we don't have that, uh, things like the heart, the lumbar, the spinal cord, projections of axons to different regions of the brain. And so uh, this tells you that there is a forum in which human cells can be tested in an embryonic environment and that the molecular consequences of acquisition of fate and change of form can now be directly studied in human. I'm going to stop here and I'm going to leave room for the discussions later on and I thank you very much for your attention. Okay, our, our third speaker and our final speaker before our discussion uh, is Stephen Dean. Uh, Stephen Dean is a designer, educator, and entrepreneur focused on digital innovation that improves people's lives. His dual passions for reason and art have manifested themselves in a career built on studying the relationship between science and design. Dedicated to the field of health and wellness, Dean's major areas of study and development are in healthcare innovation and design's effect on behavioral change. Dean is a frequent lecturer here in New York at NYU and Parsons on the topics of health uh, as it relates to design and the DIY movement, uh, as well as impacts of technology and design on individual and societal behavior. He is partner at Prehype, an innovation firm dedicated to incubating digital uh, businesses for corporations, and he also serves as principal at G51 Studio, where his, his works with wellness com where he works with wellness companies to improve product design and overall user experience. Dezine is mentor at Blueprint Health, an organization dedicated to assisting entrepreneurs forge positive change in the health and wellness industry. He's writing a book now for O'Reilly Media on the quantified on the quantified self movement, which we'll hear more about today and behavioral change. Dean holds a BS in mathematics from Baylor University and an MFA from the Rhode Island School of Design. Uh, we're pleased to have you here, Stephen Dean. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, so one of, the, one of the traditions that we have at Quantified Self is that we always like to start off with a personal story um, it's the self part in quantified self, and uh, I'll take you through some of the um, some of the other stories that we uh, that we've heard over these last several years. So this is 1972. This is my sister and my, and myself. She's a year and a half older than me here, and about two weeks after this picture was taken, she was diagnosed with type one diabetes. And um, back in those days, as as I think any disease that uh, is brought on to a to a, a young family. Uh, can really rearrange the, the household in many ways. Um, but why I like to bring this uh, up as part of one of my personal stories is that at that young age, uh, this was before glucometers and before a, our ability to test blood sugar, uh, we had to test my sister's blood sugar by having her pee in a cup and we took five drops of her urine, added it to 10 drops of water, we put it in a test tube, and then we would drop a reaction tablet in there called Clinitest, a little reagent tablet, and then it would bubble up and foam over and the test tube would get really warm and it would change color. And the color was essentially a way to indicate how much uh, sugar she was spilling in her, in her pee. And this in many ways would, would give feedback from my parents about how she should uh, adjust her insulin, but also whether or not she, should, uh, she would get her snack at night. So in many ways, my sister was the very first self-tracker that I've ever met. Um, she would write down, as a, as a very young girl, she would write down these numbers from negative to four plus as she would write it. Um, and this, this journal that she put together was taken back to 
her doctor and the doctor used that to adjust her insulin levels. Um, so at our, at our really most fundamental level, you know, what we do is we quantify ourselves with a one number, our age, and we do this for the most part our entire lives. Um, and then when we're children, I know that I did this, we, we measure our height, we quantify ourselves in terms of our growth. And about, for, for each of us is a little bit different, but at some point around my teenage years, I think I stopped measuring this. And then pretty much the rest of our lives, we, we, do, we quantify like this, we weigh ourselves. Um, and then on occasion, this is what happens, and we find this in the quantified self. Um, we refer to a lot of this as personal science and self-experiments, and although many of us might not think of this for people who are um, running a marathon, or in my case, this was 2007, uh, racing an Ironman in uh, Lake Placid, New York, well, what we do when we do this is we really undertake self-experimentation. We're doing a quite radical, um, going through a quite radical process of figuring out um, how to reach a goal, and in this case it was finishing an Ironman in 12 hours plus minutes. But I wanted to show this very simple graph uh, because I think it gets at the heart of what we talk about at Quantified Self, which is um, how you feel is not necessarily um, what's going on in the body. And I was, during this 10 months of training environment, I was given instructions by my coaches that every day I had, to, I had to quantify 12 separate data points. And one of them was my morning resting heart rate. I was to do this before I got out of bed. I was to strap on a heart rate monitor. And I was to check my, essentially, morning resting heart rate. And uh, at, at the point, we set a baseline. And I knew my average heart rate in the morning. And if it was two to three beats higher, it meant that I was fighting an infection or I was overtrained. And I was to pay attention to that. I was re it was really important to pay attention to that. Well, what happened is that there were three instances where I woke up and my morning resting heart rate was two to three beats higher, but I felt great. And I went to pra practice. I went to bike practice at 5 a.m. And each time what would happen, and these are three spikes that occurred afterwards, which I immediately got sick and I was, down, I was pretty much out for a week. And that's either caused by overtraining or uh, fighting an infection. And early stages of fighting an infection, um, not knowing it because you feel great, you know, you can, we could count on numbers like this for, for, the, for, um, for the feedback. And, you know, I mean, I would say that, uh, you know, doing something like the, uh, the kind of intense training that Ironman uh, requires is, is pretty tough on the immune system. And in doing that, it was the kind of like very close attention to, to numbers like morning resting heart rate, which were really important to, um, to stay healthy. So lots of things that we track about ourselves, um, lots of sensors that have come out on the market, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but what a lot of us are really interested in the quantified self, which I'll get more into who we are, um, is how do we start to tie all of this together, make meaning out of the, out of the sensing that we've um, improved upon. And I always like to, to show a picture of an engine because I, I, th I think also when, we, uh, when I talk about QS, we refer to it as QS, quantified self, there's always personal aspects of this. I mean, I think health and, and our own desire to improve ourselves in one form or another is um, at, the, at the core of what all of us are driven by. But um, I had a personal experience that my father knew more about his car and about his engine than he did about his body. And unfortunately, he paid, con his, he paid the consequences for that. And so I, like to, I still like to use the car as an analogy to what we see is happening right now in this movement of quantified self and the, and the rise of sensor technology. Um, that, that imagine that we were driving a car and we had no dashboard or we couldn't see out the window, that all of this was, was missing. I mean, for many of us, this is uh, our experience with our own bodies. This is what we don't want to have happen. So quantified self and personal science. So back in 2007 when I was training for an Ironman, I was reading lots of stuff online about uh, folks who were uh, doing self-experiments. Um, some of the mainstream folks were uh, uh, authors like 
Tim Ferriss, who had written a book called Four Hour Body, which was, he was really, I guess, known as both a productivity hacking guy and a, and a biohacking guy. And Seth, Seth Roberts, who was the chair of psychology at UC Berkeley, was writing a lot about this N equals one experimentation and self-experiments. And I was following Seth's blog. And in Seth's blog, he made a reference to a new blog that had launched called The Quantified Self. And it was launched by the founding editor of Wired magazine, Kevin Kelly, the futurist, and his colleague also, uh, who was a writer at Wired, named Gary Wolf. And they started this blog because they had discovered these really interesting stories that they were hearing about of individuals who were using technology and tools and methods of, of self-tracking uh, to improve something about themselves, solve a problem, um, or learn something, or reach a goal. Um, about eight months after they started the blog, Kevin hosted a, the first group at his house in Pacifica, California, and Seth Roberts came. This is Seth up there standing, and it was about 25 people at that first meetup and uh, convened, and each individual really got up and, and shared a personal story uh, with the group about you know, how they used technology or how they were using various methods um, to uncover some problem they, that they had or, or reach a goal um, that they had. And, uh, the first, the second meetup, let me back up here, the second meetup was held at the Institute for the Future in Palo Alto and I was out there in San Francisco at the time working on a project and I met Kevin and Gary and I suggested that we start uh, another group in New York, um, which we launched in 2009. I was, at the time I was teaching at Parsons here in the city and I, <clears throat> I pulled together, I pulled together my friends for the first um, meetup and I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, some of those projects that have, we've had present over the years. So these are our three prime questions that we ask our presenters to, to share with the group when we do QSO and talks. They come up and uh, they focus, the stories focus on personal self-tracking projects. They tell us what they did, how they did it, and what they learned. Um, this, uh, this is a list of the kinds of topics that people come and share about. Now, there are a lot of folks who have presentations in our show and tell talks that talk about health and personal health. Um, but we have people who are tracking dreams, we have people who are tracking aspects of happiness, um, people who are tracking expenses and how much money they spend. There are a lot of folks who are looking at um, how to manage stress in their lives and using these kinds of tools and self-tracking self tools and methods. So Quantified Self, after we launched New York, we started to launch it in other cities as well and I've been helping uh, I helped Boston and London get set up, and we've, we've now, um, this is a poster from our conference which was held a few weeks ago at Stanford University. We've now had three conferences, and we have over 70 groups around the world, about 10,000 members, and there are a little over 300 videos that are posted online of these talks. Now this looks small, and it's really a niche fringe group, but I think it's an interesting group to, to follow uh, for a number of reasons that I'll, that I'll share with you throughout the talk, and I'm gonna particularly focus this talk more on the, on the sense making that we've seen come out of Quantified Self in the visualization. So this is Katie McCurdy, who is an interaction designer. Um, she uh, lives here in New York. She just actually recently moved to Vermont, and Katie has the neuromuscular mus uh, disorder called myasthenia gravis, and Katie was really, um, as an interaction designer, she was really interested in in um, visualizing the problems that she had encountered with this disease and see if that could help her solve some of the mysteries that she had encountered. So Katie spent a lot of time drawing out periods of, of her time when she felt good and when she felt bad, different kinds of medications that she was di uh, prescribed, various interventions that came into her life. And then she turned these into these really beautiful charts that she could use to essentially tell a story, a tell a story about um, about her condition, and it was both for her own self-awareness and reflection of the history of this disease, but also to be able to share it with new doc with doctors as she um, made her way through her medical journey. So some of the things that Katie learned in her show and tell talk, um, she learned that certain periods of time those antibiotics made her sicker, that doctors were very skeptical of these kinds of graphs and charts, um, but that these health visualizations are great at storytelling and. And, and I really love this last one, that memories are data too. This is Jana Beck. Jana Beck was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when she was 19. Um, 
She is a linguistic ana uh, analyst. She's getting her PhD, doing some uh, doing work, and she really applied a lot of her own skills as um, as a scientist and as a researcher to uh, testing out a thesis, which was um, would you know adopting a carbohydrate restricted diet result in a statistically significant difference in her blood sugar. So she went about doing this by um, about a year earlier getting a, a device called a continuous glucose monitor where she's able to basically install this on her skin um, and measure glucose throughout the day and night and then make adjustments there. Um, so this is a chart showing that there was a big difference when she moved to a low carbohydrate diet. Um, some of the things that she learned uh, included that it took a lot of time for her to adjust her insulin once she, because she started to move her uh, mean levels of blood sugar down low and the visualization visualizations helped a lot. Um, this was a show and tell talk that was given here in New York by a woman named Mimi Chun who was, um, we have a lot of folks who come to QS who are tracking food. No surprise, many of us do. We, we saw the body weight scale early on. But Mimi thought, well, here's, a, here, here's something that she wanted to focus on was the color of her food. So she, um, she started to record everything that she ate, including the colors of the, of the, of the meals. Um, so this is a beautiful a chart of this, and there was a, and I do have a close-up of this as well. A little bit of a close-up. On Wednesday, she had broiled salmon filet with capers and black pepper. I think you can see that part back there. Um, this was another project by Mi Chun. This is a little blurry on the, on the projector. Um, there's a close-up here. So this was a visualization that she did. She was tracking all of her expense data every day uh, for, I think, for about a year. Um, and she was looking at different ways of, of visualizing them. Now, these have obviously very um, creative and artistic and expressive um, qualities to them. Um, I also have provide a link at the end of the at the end of this deck that you could go and uh, follow these folks. Um, some of you may know the work of Nicholas Felton. So Nicholas uh, and I had gone to school together at RISD, and when we started Quantified Self in New York, I I dragged Nicholas along to give the first presentation and. Um, after uh, Nicholas and his partner, actually his business partner, Ryan Case, they were working on a project uh, called Datum uh, at the time. And uh, he spoke about Datum, but he also gave me one of these cards after the presentation. And the card was essentially an invitation to follow a URL, to then take a survey. And I took a survey that asked me all kinds of questions about my encounter with Nicholas. And what Nicholas does is after the end of, at the end of the year, he takes all of this data that he's gathered from every encounter and he builds these really beautiful reports called annual reports. Uh, they're really personal annual, annual reports that you can um, uh, find online and I also provide the link for that. Um, so Nicholas is really exploring um, visualization and making meaning, of, meaning out of his own encounters throughout the year and not just encounters but also the things that he does. And uh, I, I encourage you to, to go to the site and to look at the different reports. And one year he, he built a report uh, solely on, um, on the history and the, and the events and experiences of his, of his father who had passed away recently. So these were a couple, these are just a couple of screenshots from, from that report. Um, and the other project I want to share is that we have a lot of folks who come to QS show and tell talks and they're really looking at ways to understand sleep uh, disorders. We have, a, we have a very serious sleep problem in this country, uh, probably not just in the U.S. And this is a device that's called the Zio, Zio sleep device, which you wear at night and it measures uh, different levels of sleep from deep sleep to REM sleep to when you wake up as well. Um, so this is a Zio graph. I also have a Zio. I didn't bring my graph on here, but I wanted to show you another uh, individual's uh, project where she was really interested in um, she was really interested in the rhythm of her nights and comparing this to her days. And she's still working on a lot of, her name is Lori Frick and she's a, she's a visual artist. So she started uh, first with the Zio sleep device and she took a lot of this data, she transferred it to an Excel spreadsheet, color coded this, this is based on uh, awake times, uh, deep sleep, REM and light sleep times. And she, she worked on this just co color coding it into Excel spreadsheet. With Zio, you can extract your sleep data and put it in, pour it into a spreadsheet. She then took that and she converted it um, and 
and started really manipulating the data in a more artistic way, less about making, like drawing conclusions the way that many of the projects uh, focus on at QS, but more looking at uh, this, um, this expressive rhythmic aspect of it. And then she took that and she went into a hand drawing. And then she took the hand drawing and then um, she did a few more and then she built these beautiful sculptures um, out, of, out of found wood that also reflect uh, the patterns that emerged out of the sleep data. And so a lot of very interesting work. And Lori has been a very active member of QS, um, has given some of the plenary talks at uh, Quantified Self around the world at different conferences. So we say this a lot, if we can measure it, we can improve it. Um, and the last project I wanted to share with you is where this has kind of entered into the commercial realm. Um, it, uh, between 1981 and 1987 in Barcelona, there were 26 uh, separate asthma epidemics uh, that occurred. And this took scientists and researchers um, an enormous amount of time to try to get at the problem. Um, and it wasn't really until they started uh, asking and interviewing a lot of the patients uh, who were having these asthma attacks in emergency rooms around the, around the city that the asthma attacks had occurred generally near the center of the city and over by the water. So they decided that what they would do is they went to the, to the um, shipping co uh, companies and they started comparing the logs there with the, the incidents and the dates and times of the asthma outbreaks. And what they discovered was that there were ships being unloaded of, of soybeans and soybean dust uh, was really discovered as a new etiologic agent of asthma attacks. So they identified soybean dust as a problem, and then they were able to contain that as these uh, ships were unloading soybean dust. So asthma it's a, is a very um, interesting, this is a very interesting story, uh, particularly around how you, uh, get, uh, the chief epidemiologist at the CDC, David Van Sickle, was frustrated by the lack of real-time data on asthma outbreaks, much like what we just saw in Barcelona. So David thought, well, why can't we put a sensor onto an inhaler? Um, so some of you may have asthma, you've seen other people with inhalers, and he thought, let's, why can't we put a sensor on here and so that every time a patient takes a dose from their inhaler, we record a timestamp and we record the location data of the in incidence of that asthma outbreak. So David, um, so David left and started a company, uh, the name of the company is Asmapolis, and um, so they've, they've designed a small sensor that you attach easily to most, rescue, what, uh, most inhalers and so that when each individual patient uh, takes a dose from the drug, um, there's a timestamp and also um, he's, they've simplified, they've sim since simplified the sensor and detached the GPS component to it and now we're relying on the phones, uh, both uh, smartphones and feature phones. So the power of, I think, this idea is that um, not only is the individual getting real factual data about asthma outbreaks and the, and, the, uh, and the frequency of those outbreaks, but we're also now getting public health data information in real time. And even that information can be fed back to the individuals uh, throughout that city to kind of guide them places that they should steer clear of as well. Um, so I got to work on this project um, in uh, uh, just last year, and I think what was really exciting about working on it was, was both taking that kind of application of the model that many of us have started to see emerge in quantified self, and applying it to the larger to a larger set of population in a, at a public health level. And this is just a screenshot of the of the patients dashboard. There's also a lot of mobile components to this as well. So, um, the mobile is uh, is. Uh, provides the GPS coordinates for the patient and then there's lots of feedback mechanisms within the, within the mobile app to, um, to help them manage their uh, asthma better. So, our so one of the questions we ask is, are individuals and patients, are they really interested in the data alone? And in QS, we have, a, uh, we have a community of highly motivated individuals and yes, they are, but for the most part, uh, the general population um, we don't think that they're so interested in the data alone. But the information, uh, surely, and then the knowledge that I think many of them gain, definitely, and this is the thing that we're seeing as some of the tools to, to get to that point of, the, of trans, translating the data to knowledge is through data visualization. Thank you very much.
So I think uh, we want to allow uh, the audience to ask a few questions. And now, um, I'd first like to invite all the panelists up, and you know, maybe uh, Laura and I will um, will start it off. But then we want to ask some questions uh, from the audience. So. I mean, first, I, I want to really uh, thank our panelists for um, you know three very mind-blowing presentations. Um, I think they kind of uh, point to the future of data visualization in many ways. Um, to me, they challenge uh, the stereotype of what the, the current state of d data visualization is. Um, and I think it was a great way you know, for us to kind of to kick off publicly this, this year-long project. Um, I have a, a, you know, s several questions on my mind, but one thing that I wanted to, to ask was to, to see if we can turn a little bit to, um, to education in thinking about this, and, but, but maybe even make it a little more personal to like a lot of us in the room here. And, um, and that is to kind of say, one way of asking my question is, um, what did it take to make these incredible projects you know, that you've shown tonight? Um, but maybe a more specific way um, is, is to say, uh, you know, or actually this is a more general way, but like, does the next generation of data visualization problems um, require a certain kind of interdisciplinary focus um, you know, that, that we don't already have? Um, does it require something like looking at things at multiple scales simultaneously? I think that was a certain trend between the work, um, you know, from um, self to community, uh, you know, from cell to organism, uh, from novel to society. So does it require that kind of approach, almost too big for one mind? Um, does it require um, both this combination of the, the science, the number crunching, and the art. Um, does it possibly require new kinds of schools or curriculums? But, you know, so if that's the big question, then maybe one, one thing I'd just like to ask each of you to, to reflect on about your own work is what did it take you to get there to show this, you know, cutting edge stuff, which we're, we're not seeing everywhere. I mean, all of this is incredibly new and inspiring work, you know, I think in your bio it's, it's very clear um, that it was, it's an art and a science mm -hmm. background combined, degrees in both, but you know, I'm wondering if each of you could just say a few words about that. Yeah, I'll say um, a couple of things, I mean, I have, I have definitely found uh, this to be a challenge. It's probably been one of the more challenging aspects of of the work that I do is that as more and more data comes in to, to in a, on the professional side of the work that I do, um, I do not feel like I have a tool set to to hang to, to wrangle it. Uh, I wasn't taught this. I mean, I think that I have, you know, I'm fortunate that I have, you know, I spent many years as a as an actuary on the math side, and then I combined it with the design side, and so somehow I've been sensitive to it. But I, um, I've, I've str I know I have struggled, and a lot of my colleagues have struggled of not having the tools. But, but why I've been excited in the QS space in particular is that people have, are highly motivated, and they're taking the time to be thoughtful and purposeful of looking at d simple data sets and doing a simple chart, even as, as simple as a timeline, and then building on that. And I think that's, um, I mean, it's kind of baby, it's been baby steps for me and for I think a lot of the other people. And then you push it, and there's, you know, there's not necessarily any right or wrong way. That's why I like Mimi's work, because she's just, <clears throat> um, and uh, though I don't acknowledge anyone in the talk, there's a long list of, of folks from disciplines outside of literature that, that need to be acknowledged. Um, one of my earliest collaborations was with a uh, PhD student in statistics with an emphasis in biostatistics. Um, and then uh, another uh, strong collaboration with a computer scientist who um, is uh, uh, an expert on machine learning. Um, and, uh, and then I've borrowed heavily from, 
folks in linguistics and computational, uh, sorry, corpus, uh, corpus linguistics in particular. Um, part of the reason that I left Stanford recently is because what, uh, at the University of Nebraska, they've just invested very heavily in a digital humanities cluster hire, basically a hire of six new faculty to join an already existing very strong program where there'll be many more opportunities for me to collaborate with, with uh, folks outside my discipline. And really, uh, were it not for that, I'd probably still be um, just you know, reading Moby Dick and looking for um, you know, <laughs> new, new things there. So this has revolutionized uh, the, the work that I'm doing. Well, I guess it's pretty much uh, it has been said, and I will echo it again, that in my particular case, uh, being handcuffed more by the reality of the way things are and the description of those facts, uh, the kind of image and visualization that I show cannot be done by one single discipline or one given expertise. At Rockefeller, we're lucky enough to have a theoretical physics group that is extremely powerful in, in writing the algorithms that the microscopes need to use to capture these images, the virtual reality paradigm. Um, at the end of the day, though, uh, I think everybody fulfills their own niche in terms of responsibility. The art of tool making is amazingly precious in, in my field, and, and scientific discovery always relies on the refinements of existing tools and the discovery of new tools. And uh, as this momentum is pushed forward, as the microscopes and the optics are becoming more interesting, as the computer programs that analyze large data sets are becoming more powerful, as projections and mathematical modeling takes over, you know, to a large extent, human imagination. I think that improves that we want it or not, the quality of what we observe and the way we interpret things. And to me, it's a necessity. It's not, it's not a luxury or a choice. I don't think that we could push this beyond where we are. If it wasn't for that kind of contribution, I would be also probably be reading Moby Dick or looking at the a tadpole in the pond if it not wasn't. Not that there's for, anything wrong with no, that. No, 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 no. I love Moby Dick. <laughs> Um, so I, I have, I have my, my question changed actually after hearing the, the three of you talk. Um, and so the, the question has to do with the idea of image interpretation, right? Because I think um, at, the, at the basis of this project that we're trying to do through collaboration and visualization is that as um, visualization specialists, we're trying to collaborate such that we can help um, help and you know that we can collaborate on communicating in a clearer way to a different audience mm -hmm. and so I think the the three of you have very different approaches I think the quantified self is really to communicate to a broader public and to a everyday to really to an everyday public and um, Matthew you kept showing interpretations of your images as you were as you were doing that really highlighting things and you know pointing, uh, showing what you're highlighting, et cetera. And Ali, you know, your, your images without hearing you talk, I would have had a much harder time understanding, although the images are just so stunningly beautiful and mesmerizing. I'm not surprised you were just working with Pierre Huge. I, w I would love to know what you, what you did. So I'm just curious in your different approaches to um, how you think about um, clear communication as part of the work, and is it clear communication to a broader public, or is it a clear communication for yourselves in understanding your own discipline? Yeah. Okay, so for me it's, uh, it's essential in, in many different levels. And, mm. uh, communication not only in terms of expressing the, the consequence of the end product that, mm. that I show, and and the way the arguments are relying on the evidence and the resolution of the evidence that I present. But also way upstream of that, before this final image or this final movie is put together, the way it's, it's rotating, the angle that it takes, uh, each one of them is a consequence of also communication with the students and the postdocs in my lab who are involved with this and each one of us sees the resolution of the problem with different eyes coming from different horizons, trying to focus to the same point, 
at yet from different angles. And so uh, that kind of discussion is necessary before even anything is projected. And then the same data set can be shown and communicated in a way that fits pretty much the audience. The way I talk about my embryos and, and my cells to this audience is obviously different than the way that I would talk about it to a scientific mm -hmm. audience, and certainly different uh, and the, the way Pierre, Hugh, and I would discuss it in the context right, but of- But you use the same images. It's exactly, with the same images. Exactly, the same yeah. images. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I appreciate very much the fact that you find them to be beautiful and attractive, <laughs> and, and, and obviously share that with you, and I find it to be the same way in a main different level. That already says something about um, the way we, we communicate results, that, that scientific results, in my point of view, do not need to be dry and humanless and devoid from emotions or passion. In the contrary, the work becomes you and you become the work. And there is a lot of me and, and the people in the lab in that mouse embryo, and, and it really is, uh, <laughs> is, it is our own expression to a large extent that, <laughs> that defines and the communication at that level. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. yeah. So, Alex, do you, um, does, the, does, the, does, does the display actually aid you in further discovery? In other words, absolutely. once you make the yeah. image clear, yeah. you then become able to be clearer about the idea that you were looking at? Absolutely, yes. So, to a large extent, the whole uh, attempt to improve the resolution and the rotations and the uh, algorithms that support uh, the imaging platform from virtual reality to four-dimensional imaging is exactly based on that. We're not necessarily doing this to make it aesthetically pleasing. We're doing, we're doing it as a necessity to get higher resolution. The way you wire, for example, in the nervous system of a tadpole that's made of millions of cables connecting within a very precise uh, beginning and end points and in a very dynamic way, sometimes attaching, attaching to reattach someone else requires a kind of resolution that but the more we dissect this, the more we also appreciate the beauty of what that represents. And sometimes, I have to be honest with you, that the aesthetic aspect of it takes over the knowledge aspect of it. And, and, and we were mesmerized by the beauty of it before we even try to ask questions as to is there any correlation between the way, the temporal or spatial way, these things are assembled. We cannot help it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mabel has a question. Yeah. Mabel. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I thought these were three incredible presentations that each dealt very differently with, with visualization, like how do you visualize this quantitative data. And I guess my question um, to all three of you, and it goes back to maybe Laura's question about the image and also questions of aesthetics, is that as you make visible, are there ethical questions about what's being made visible in that regard. So for example, with photographers who are, let's say, you know, photographing scenes of destruction and mayhem and death, I mean, there's always the ethical question about what does it mean to make a representation of something that's actually happened. So I'm just wondering in terms of your own work or in your own processes, do these ethical questions about what's being made visible come into your work at any point? Or you've seen it in other people's work? I don't know uh, that this rises to the level of scenes of destruction, um, but uh, in the network visualizations that I'm doing, uh, an important thing is that the software is a dynamic thing, but the presentation is a static image taken from that. So every, every image, every static image is a reduction of the content that's really available to me as a researcher at any given moment. So every time I produce one of these slides, I, I do have a moment where I have to think, but, but, but what about the rest of the data that I'm not showing at this time? So you have to be very careful about you know, acknowledging that, that there's all this other stuff going on that you can't see at the same time. I guess that, that would be the, the place where the ethical question comes in. You know, to the extent that that's a distortion of the full picture. Every mm -hmm. picture is a distortion of the full picture. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think in, um, probably not gonna be able to, comment directly, but a couple of things I wanted to say is one, I felt like I saw the future of quantified self-visualization in your presentations because <laughs> if, I mean, I felt like what I saw like 10 years from now that at the individual level that we'll, we will have tools that allow us to make, to basically do interactive visualization on a data set 
So as we're trying to make meaning out of our data that's coming in real time from all the sensors attached to us and to our environment and to our world, and then being able to make decisions in real time based on the kind of analysis that you were doing. We don't, we don't really have tools quite like that yet, but I started to see it uh, in, in there. And I think that, you know, I mean, this is the, the, the one thing that we all, the, at the QS level that we're always struggling with is that we only see a small, a small slice of, of, um, of the full picture. And we're always, um, you know, I mean, I think we're always questioning and it's, it's a, we try to say, I mean, I, I know I tell my students this at, at NYU is I say, you know, focus, get really precise and focus on the specific target behavior that we're, that we're working on. Um, but then we start, as you start to branch out and look at the larger context, there's all this other stuff that we haven't even looked at yet. Um, but we're just trying to shift or change one small behavior. But of course, there's a, a ripple effect, uh, things that we don't see. Um, it's not as, the, like the interactive tool, the visualization tools that we have aren't as multi-dimensional as I think we would like and as interactive as some of the things that mm -hmm. I saw today. Hi, uh, <clears throat> yes, my question is about the technology behind the quantum dots. And I was just interested in um, not only the technology, physically what they are, but if um, they can record other types of data besides visual topological changes, um, if there's other signals they can uh, make. Okay, so I, I will answer your question. It's uh, really a, a physics question, so you might want to also explore it with people who develop this technology rather than those who use them, uh, like my lab does. But basically, it's an amazing, uh, it's a ma an amazing nanoparticle. It basically, at the quantum level, it's uh, it's a particle that spins so fast that it emits a given light at the, at the given frequency of wavelengths that never disappears. Most of the light the way we know, uh, including that that comes from the sun or a candle that's very easy to, to imagine, at one point diminishes and gradually is faded away. Uh, fluorescent signals from the jellyfish or bacteria in the ocean, if you shine too much light to it, at some point get bleached out and they're no longer there. Quantum dots, for very magical reasons that we're not going to go to, are forever. So that's one of their principles is that once they start shining, they will shine for as long as you're willing to look at them. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to image something over a very long period of time, let's say not necessarily one cell to 40 million cells of a tadpole within 48 hours or 24 hours, but they say the progression of a tumor uh, in a body that not only the primary, but the aspect of metastasis that takes a single cell to other sites and you want to image that and follow that in function of time, this is right now one of the most promising technologies that allows you to perpetuate this imaging over a very, very long period of time with tremendous level of resolution, basically subcellular resolution. The technology is such that you can label different individual proteins, never mind cells or subcellular uh, components of the cell. So this is the advantage of it. Like every other tool in the world, there's also limitations, and, and there's advantage of quantum dots. One thing is the fact that they are, are biologically very unfriendly. Uh, it's very difficult to solubilize quantum dots in an uh, aqueous phase. So everything that's, every life that's based on water and liquid, which is all that we know of, it's very difficult to make them compatible. And there's a tremendous scrutiny right now in trying to uh, have bowel more details <laughs> Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. I just wanted to thank all of you for your presentations. They're all, I, I'm still stunned. Um, just <laughs> a general question um, for K through 12 education. I'm just curious as to how a project like this could maybe be extracted and put into, let's say you have a urban district who's trying to expand its STEM programs and you really want to bring this kind of uh, visualization and other things, or if you have a literature program that's trying to get off the ground and you're trying to expand um, literary access to kids who might not have already have it, how would you take a project of this scale with this sort of resources and not necessarily downscale it, but make it appropriate and highly feasible for um, K-12 education? Uh, I'm not sure that this will answer your question or not, but uh, one of the things that that uh, we can do with the kind of data that I've got is to identify, um, well, 
Yeah, the, the bad example would be when you go to Amazon and you look at a book, it shows you other people who bought that book and what they bought. That's a social-based recommendation, but we can do an actual content-based recommendation in this way, where if someone is, has read a particular book, and assuming we have all the books in our, in our system, and we're trying very hard right now to get access to that 20 million that Google scanned, by the way. Uh, but <laughs> if, if we have that book in the system, we can then identify other books in its neighborhood, right, that would share similar style and similar themes, and that may be a way of opening up a door to reading new, new books. Um, like, echoing everyone's comments, um, I was uh, taken by like how uh, engaging each image is, but what I'm kind of curious about in a historical framework is given that um, visualization and, and representation of complex phenomena have been happening as long as we can you know, make a mark on something. Um, I'm curious how you, um, to follow up sort of what Mabel is saying, how you think about the things that you're not able to represent or that you know are there, but that you, you're not yet, you know, the instruments aren't yet sensitive to. So I'm thinking, for example, of um, in neuroscience, you know, the discovery that, you know, white matter was actually vital to the, the, the function of, you know, gray cells, but until we could visualize or even track the nutrients moving through them, we didn't, you know, we attributed no function to them. So I guess it's a broad question about both how do you look at that data that you're not sure is there, or you know is there, but you're not sure how it relates, and then also, how do you prevent the visualizations from circumscribing you know, an explanation before that data can come in? So, uh, it's, a, it's a great question you're, you're mm -hmm. asking to a large extent. You're asking what is the limit of our knowledge in trying to measure things that we don't even know exist, and, and uh, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is really that. that, that you really cannot answer that until you open up the Pandora box. And, and once you open it, then you deal with what you have in front of you, and then you design your visualization based on what it is that you're trying to solve. Uh, your example is a very good example in nervous system, but one thing that intrigues me the most right now is the way we can, uh, we're failing to measure time. And I don't mean time in a, in a physical Newtonian sense of a clock ticking unidirectionally, but uh, in the context of biological time where you can actually reverse that process. I, I started the talk by talking about cloning, where you can take uh, the nucleus of an adult cell or in, nowadays uh, an entire cell and reprogram it back to become a fertilized egg and regenerate a whole organism out of a cell from the base of your hair or your skin. And uh, there are really two ways of thinking about that and that, that thinking about it leads to the design of tools and visualization that are going to be required to dissect it at the scientific level. And the one way to think about it is to say that a, a given history of a cell that you're returning back in time is being replayed backwards. A little bit like if you had a movie going on and then you would watch the movie from the end part all the way to the beginning of the title of the movie. So you would go to the same series of hierarchical decisions uh, in, in the physical sense and biological sense to get and then you reverse it back. The second way to think about it is that it completely bypasses the history from which it comes from. It actually generates an independent path to come back from the origin. So uh, one of the big efforts in my lab right now is to base on designing visualization tools that would allow to distinguish how this reversal of time actually occurs. And unlike physical time that is unidirectional, except when you go to, of course, Einstein's uh, space and time theory and linearity where things get a little bit different. Uh, this is the only one paradigm where we can actually physically measure uh, returning something to its origins by means that we do not have yet. I'm, I'm confident that we'll be able to do it, but that's another example. You, usually in, in, in my world, you don't have to think about it until you're confronted with it face to face and then you attack. Mm -hmm. Take one last, one last question, David. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to talk about. Um, well, I want to ask what, what exactly is good data, um, and the various trade-offs between availability and quality of data sets. I know within natural language processing, which Matthew Jocker is here probably familiar with, um, there's a complaint that research is very corpus-driven. 
Um, specifically speaking within parsing and syntax, there's a large corpus called the Penn Tree Bank, and most of it is just sentences culled from the Wall Street Journal. And how, so, so results, I guess, from the Wall Street Journal, how generalizable are they for the greater universe of data that we can't touch? Um, and I think, Stephen, you also uh, touched upon this with doctors' skepticism of uh, personal accounts of health. Um, and so I guess I wanted to know, I guess, your own conflicts between how available your data is and how do you evaluate it for its quality. I'm just curious, what field are you from? What's um, your I'm a uh, computer science. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I'll make a few comments about, we, we have a lot of, there are a lot of conversations in the health field about the fact that traditional health care in this system and in, in our country, uh, there's a lot of siloed data. There's a lot of data that's locked up and there are a lot of QSers who are, who are trying to get access to their data um, as patients. And uh, it's a big, um, we, we had a lot of uh, conversation about that. I think um, uh, something else I wanted to say, your, your, the, the comment that you made, um, but I've just drawn a blank. I forgot what it was. <laughs> I'm going to come back to it. Well, you, you asked a good question um, because it's very relevant. Last week, uh, two colleagues and I, uh, two legal scholars and I, published an article in Nature, a comment piece in Nature about um, the amicus brief that we authored in support of uh, Google against, uh, in the case versus the Authors mm -hmm. Guild, essentially uh, asking the court to um, rule that the kind of work that, that I want to do as a literary scholar, mining those texts, that that be identified as a non, specifically identified as a non-expressive use of that content. Uh, the reason that I'm studying the 19th century right now and not the 20th, early 20th century, which was in fact the period that I trained in as a literary scholar, is because of copyright. I don't have access to a large corpus of 20th century material. Basically after 1923, I'm in trouble. So, uh, good question. Go and, uh, and uh, put up your banners in <laughs> support of the uh, Google uh, in that case. Yeah. So maybe I can make a comment about the science part of, of your question. In science, it's very easy to distinguish good data from bad data. If somebody can reproduce your data, the data is good. If nobody can reproduce it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't exist. So reproducibility of a given fact or discovery is the essence of agreeing with a given observation and a conclusion. Now, this being said, some of it is sometimes very difficult to reproduce, and sometimes it takes shape of the data itself not being accurate. And that creates an overlap with your question, the question that was asked before about ethics and how it influences the approach. In science, uh, to a large extent, the production of data that is limited to small numbers of biological material is not accessible to all scientists. Um, one very good example was about a year ago where the Korean scientists uh, very strongly advertised the fact that they have cloned a human being. And uh, it took only one month to prove that this was absolutely not the case, even though the human embryos and human nuclei are very, very difficult to find. That's one of the signatures of science that you have to be very careful when you come up and you say something about your work that if, if you're not standing by your data and your data is not being reproduced, it's going to eliminate itself and, and you're not allowed to make a mistake uh, even once after that you're finished. Okay. Yeah. I'm just going to take one more question and then, and then maybe Ed can conclude. Um, maybe this builds off of what David initially kind of asked you after the talks. It was interesting to see these three very different perspectives on data visualization, three very different uses, and it kind of reminded me of how, I guess, in any institutional culture, uh, or between institutional cultures, it's always difficult to communicate, and maybe especially so within academia, where you have these very specialized vocabularies and conceptual ways of approaching things. I guess my question for you three is, after watching each other's presentations, do you feel as though you're operating in the same space? Or to put it another way, is it, do you think there's something inherently kind of cross-cutting about visualization that maybe begins to reach across some of those divides? 
<laughs> Tough question. Well, I will say, yeah, I mean, I felt a little like this is new, the language that was new that they were using, but I mean, I think my takeaway, what I, what I alluded to at the beginning was I felt like I was seeing the future because you are taking this very thoughtful, very purposeful view of, 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 of abstract numbers. I mean, in a way, they're very abstract, right? The data sets, and you're trying to create something that is visual and representational, and you can make meaning out of it and tells a story. And that's what we're trying to do. I mean, that's what many of us are trying to do in QS. And we, and you know, there are tools that are coming out, but we're. Um, uh, I haven't seen. I haven't seen a, a, a QSer, as we call them. I haven't seen someone come and give a presentation like the way that you guys have presented, where there's this deep analysis and you're using an interactive kind of visualization tool. But I think there, um, uh, you know, we don't have visualization uh, curriculum at, at ITP, or we really didn't have it at, at Parsons, so I can't say that there is like, some canonical form or some like, common language that's beginning to emerge out of data visualization that cuts across our disciplines. I hope so. Yeah, that's what we're trying But maybe to that's what you guys are yeah, doing, that's right? That's what maybe, we're trying to explore. Right? Maybe that's what cluster yeah. is, right? Cluster. <laughs> Ed, do you have any final yeah. observations or words? Um, but I just, the, uh, this conversation was, is an example of the kind of conversation that I was dreaming about when we started to put this together, which is that um, the ability, the using computing and using the tools of the very sophisticated tools of physics, quantum dots especially, means that the possibility of dynamic data um, with all different kinds of ways of interpreting and expressing it is now possible. Mm -hmm. And so the aspiration has to be that you are looking at 19th century novels dynamically rather than mm -hmm. statically, and also you're providing access to it to a group of people who would be interested in the underlying patterns and maybe not the literature per se, but they might be interested, become interested in it. So the idea, I think, in an academic environment is now to integrate through these uh, very complex forms and make uh, visualization accessible to more people with more insights and more pattern recognition than they've ever had before. So that's what we're aspiring to do by having you all come here and, and, and for all of you now who've heard it, we have to make it true too. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank, Thank you all for coming. Yeah, thanks so much for coming.